be thine and not mine. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. From this morning's collect, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. This morning we come to the concluding Sunday of our epiphanal season. Ash Wednesday is upon us, and we are on the cusp of Lent. The Christian calendar observes this climax and shift of seasons with recognition of what many scholars believe to be Christ's most significant teaching moment and His central epiphany outside of His passion. Today, we discuss the transfiguration. At St. Michael and Anniston, a beautiful stained glass window on the west-facing wall of the nave <coughs> commemorates the significance of this event. It was dedicated in memory of Alvis Williams, a respected benefactor of that parish, and his nephew, Dr. Bill Ferguson, maintains his legacy in that community. I mention it because in the late afternoon light, as the sun is setting, especially in and around autumn, the light and colors cast through and reflecting dew to this striking and iconic artwork are spectacular to the extent that it has the might to give reason to stop immediately in one's tracks. Happened to me multiple times. Just to admire with great wonder, marveling at its beauty. Light penetrating into the room, dispelling the darkness. Paul references the dynamic, authentic <coughs> nature of light this morning as the New Testament pairing with our gospel account of the transfiguration. We have discussed the illuminating and contrasting power of epiphanies for the past few weeks. It has been fun. And I, appreciate, and I anticipate next year's season of revealings and happenings. I think they will be equally challenging and adventurous. But first, today, we consider Elisha. Well, Elisha and Elijah. Shh and shh. Never could get that right when I was in Sunday school as a kid. This morning is promotion day for Elijah, considered by Jewish academia to be the quintessential prophet. Moses and Samuel, also stalwarts of that order, held additional responsibilities as well. By day's end, Elijah will be whisked away into the next life, and his sidekick, Elisha, the boy wonder, he is determined to be front and center when it all happens. He doesn't want to miss the epiphany. Elisha is zealous. He's persistent. Despite multiple efforts by Elijah to, well, ditch him. It reminds me of Jacob wrestling the angel. He would not let go until the revealing happened. Sidebar here. Augustine is quoted as saying that our hearts are restless until we find our rest in thee with literal and allegorical interpretation. Eric Matajas, in his biography of Bonhoeffer, says that Christianity is less about cautiously avoiding sin than it is about courageously and actively seeking God's will. So much of what this journey of becoming, self-transfiguration, it entails an intentional, indefatigable pursuit of God. Well, back to our story. Everyone seems to be in on the gig. Did you notice that? But Elijah is not giving away his hand. 
Elisha and all the prophets they encounter on their way to Elijah's launch pad, well, they know what's going on. All the while, Elisha stays focused. You get the feeling that he's anxiously watching Elijah's every move. So he will not be able to shake him, you know, and I don't know, slip away. And when I say slip away, I mean slip away. Another sidebar, last one today. Many people believe that the only prophets during this era were the ones who had scrolls or later books named after them. Actually, Israel was packed full of them. In fact, schools of prophecy existed throughout the land. Do you think those schools were rivals? I mean, you could have the mouthpieces of God versus the oracles in the annual inspiration bowl. Maybe not. Okay. Well, anyway, some of these instit institutes are portrayed negatively. Basically, they were just yes men for the king, while others, like in today's instance, are positively aligned with the Spirit. Psalm 133, ecce quam bonum in the Latin, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That is the motto of Suwani, the University of the South. It seems that the unity inferred by the psalmist is more than just camaraderie, but a spiritual bonding that assures us right pathways and God's presence. It just works better when we are in accord with God and our brother. Nonetheless, Elijah marches on to the Jordan. And there we see the lesser celebrated of the miraculous water crossing stories. I mean, everyone knows the one in Exodus with Moses and Charlton Heston and... Oh, anyway, so... But let's just suppose that some similarities exist between the two. First in Exodus, the children of Israel, they go down into the Reed Sea that Moses has parted. They are immersed in the water safely to come up on the banks of the other side cleansed and prepared for their entrance into their long-awaited promised land. They are emancipated from their Egyptian bondage, freed to pursue a new becoming. Wow, what a happening. Second, Elijah and Elisha, they go down into the Jordan River again safely, to come out on the other side, prepared, cleansed, freed from their bondage so they could experience their revealing, both sages readied for the next phase in their becoming. Does it sound familiar? Reminiscent of an experience that we all share? We at our baptism cross through the consecrated waters in anticipation of our new journey and our divine encounters, cleansed, freed, emancipated from our bonds, our own revealing transfiguration. Well, meanwhile, Elisha waited upon the Lord, as we discussed last week, he must have been frightened as the fiery chariot and the imposing horses swept his counterpart away. I mean, you just don't see that kind of stuff every day. But the mantle was passed on to him, and he was enlightened. What a story. But wait, there's more. The next we hear of Elijah is in today's gospel parakopi. Mark's account, as many of you will applaud, is the more brief and direct version of the transfiguration. Remember his theme of immediacy and urgency. The other synoptics are more detailed. John references transfiguration, but never really actually re recounts the event. And we have yet another reference in 2 Peter. Here's the story, roughly. Jesus heads back into the wilderness, but this time he takes three of the disciples with him, and they must have been thinking, oh boy, here we go again. They had no idea. They head up to a mountaintop. Now, 
The Christian story has been described as a sequence of mountaintops. We kind of hop from one to the next to the next. Noah and the ark's final resting place. The patriarchs frequented cliff tops with God. There's the burning bush. Elijah and the still small voice. Transfiguration. Golgotha. One after another and on and on. Something tells me that you might know a little something about spiritual peaks transforming changing you? Well, Mark wastes no time, but gets right to it. They no sooner arrive at the top and unpack their pop tents before Jesus happens to them. I love that description. He morphs into a, a dazzling white, and the light is blinding bright. There's that light that Paul referenced earlier, illuminating our story and if that's not wild enough, Moses and, Moses and Elijah appear next to him. They've been dead for a long time. The three disciples were freaking out, kind of like Elisha, but they were enlightened as well. The grand epiphany was immediately in front of them. Christ, bridging the gap between prophecy and Torah, fulfilling all that was foretold and completing the law. The culmination of the biblical narrative and the essence of a Jewish Christ were displayed right before their eyes in living color. Jesus was transfigured. And so were they forever transformed. They were changed. No wonder these guys and their peers turned the world upside down. The mantle had been passed on to them. Now honestly, I don't know why they were admonished to keep the experience quiet. That seems a little odd. The timing's weird right there. Maybe the moment wasn't right for the magnitude of this sort of revelation. Maybe it was a liberty taken by the author to explain how an occurrence of that kind of magnitude did not have more of a direct impact at that time. I mean, think about it. If this had proliferated, all of Israel would have been in an uproar. I don't think everyone was ready. Only a few had been transfigured like the three disciples or the exiting Israelites or Elisha standing by the Jordan River with his clothing torn in two. More revealing had to occur. Christ needed time to happen to more people like me and you. Would they be ready? Would they be ready by the time he reached Jerusalem? Jesus comes off the mountain and turns his head towards Jerusalem and his passion. Would they be ready for the cross or his resurrection? You realize Jesus is still happening today. Today. Yet it is hard to transform and be changed and be readied with all of our modern busyness. But Lent is coming nonetheless. Good Friday and Easter soon thereafter. Are you ready? The epiphany is right before you. Are you ready? Amen.